Aloha, my name is Garrett Ford, and this is my lecture on advanced Uvatonian metaphysics in my novel theories in physics lecture series. First, I'll be talking about magnetic fields and light waves. So with iron stars, there's a the idea that um, at the end of time, so to speak, um, the uh, as protons decay, everything would become iron. Now, what I am proposing is that gravity as we know it is actually magnetic fields, um, magnetism from the future, pulling things towards where they need to be um, in the future in a kind of, um, I don't know if it, it makes sense the way that I can see it in my head, but I, I can see these lines of magnetism coming out from poles, and these poles are connected to the future, and we see the pole, the magnetic pole, as a, a line through something. Uh, you know, you have a planet, you've got your magnetic pole, and it's at, you know, 23 whatever degrees. Now, imagine if you can, you know, you have the, of course, the fields coming out of that. But now, if we were to, let's say, extrapolate these fields into the future, where this planet is going, being pulled, being acted upon by other bodies, as it moves through this system, it, both exerting and being exerted upon, it will eventually arrive to its terminus in the iron star future. And in the same way that at the start of, um, I, I don't like to, I don't believe in the Big Bang really. Um, I, I think it's not a, a matter of beginnings and ends and begin, Big Bang has a connotation that it's somehow the start when it's not anyways so I digress uh, so what you would have is you have your white bowl and from the white bowl you have all this energy and matter and everything shooting out in all chaotic directions away from the well we'll go into the fluid dynamics in another lecture but um, you can kind of see uh, the the singularity of everything being sucked in and then it is combined and then it sprays out again it builds up in density and then we repeat and so um, what it's looking like is that the white bowl is the other end of the the black hole so to speak and now the white bowl of course you have what's called the Buys bar limit the measurable limit and so that's right about here, where you can't get anything past it, where um, a black hole, you, once you go beyond the uh, event horizon, you can't get anything out of it. Um, and so what we would need to do for some of this is uh, looking for white bowls as kind of universal clocks. We know that we're entering a different era the more white bowls we start to see in the same token, the more black holes we start to see, the more we know where we are in terms of our era um, and, or aeon, wherever we are in the life cycle of a universe. Um, and so with this, it, it kind of upsets, uh, you know, probably causality in some ways, but I don't even see it as that. I see it as why is it so strange that the, uh, great outpouring of energy from the start of this, I call them called the water spout uh, of uh, creation. You know, it, it's pouring out from this big bang. I'm doing the finger uh, quotations, but you can't see that. Uh, why is it strange that that is acting upon our present, and uh, not strange that that acts upon our present, but it is strange to propose that the future is acting upon its past. Um, so yeah, that's, um, that's the piece around our magnetic fields and, um, light waves. Uh, another thing to understand would be, um, in the universe that is made of iron at the end of time, 
um, there would be uh, light would probably still exist, except it would instead of being light as we would perceive it, we would it would probably be uh, a world of um, sound. So sound would be the new light. Um, red would probably be the brightest possible color in the same way that right now we perceive of, oh, you know, there was that very high energy state of the universe back when it was very young um, for our corner of creation. And the brightest color would have been the, you know, the brightest uh, uh, pale turquoise um, as, it, as it shifts into, you know, ultraviolet. And so what we would have is sound as light in that universe. As light. Uh, I, sorry, my pen on my my tablet has not been, it's been acting up. So my, my drawings will not be as good for this lecture. Um, uh, furthermore, uh, I believe that the, um, uh, the, the other piece is that in the very young universe, um, that uh, ultraviolet, oh, you know, there it is, there it is, ultraviolet light. So we have that's infrared IR, and you have ultraviolet. Now that would be, uh, we can't perceive it as ourselves. Uh, however, we're comp always in inundated by it, you know, cosmic rays and all the different types of radiation. We call it radiation, but it's just light we don't perceive. And so we exist actually kind of in a, in a maybe a Goldilocks zone um, that we can see the light um, that we can. Uh, however, we haven't seen any white holes, white bowls rather yet. We've seen black holes. So that tells us where we are maybe in the... Um, the, the lifespan of the, our corner of the universe, um, or our observable universe, I guess. So uh, that's, that's some things to keep in mind when understanding this. Uh, of course, the main takeaway here is that uh, magnetism is, uh, these magnetic fields and gravity are, are actually um, one and the same, and it's, and it's just the, the gravity um, is being expressed um, to us as this phenomenon that's coming, you know, it's uh, coming out of, let's say, that, that pole like I showed you. But what you can almost imagine is that is uh, kind of the, the pinnacle point. Oh, wow, this is not working good for drawing. Um, and the, the, um, the various uh, fields are all interacting from that, and it's all connecting and you have a kind of a push and pull you have the push and pull of light waves and then of course the um uh, the fields from uh, uh gravity but now the the fields it's it's kind of understanding that it's two sides of the, the same coin um, or the same side of many coins um, and so perhaps a white bowl and a black hole actually have a core that might be um, an iron star kind of existing in this place of um, physics that we can't even really fathom, right? I mean, I spend a lot of time trying to fathom it and sometimes it hurts my head. Uh, anyways, that's, that's enough on this one for today. Um, so we'll... Uh, move on to another one. I will talk more about um, some of the visualizations I, I, I've been doing to try and see this in my mind. Um, and uh, I'll, I'll cover that in another lecture. But um, yeah, there, there is some visualizations. One of them, I think, is, um, and I've talked about it before, imagining that, you know, you get a sweater for Christmas from your auntie, and it's a very nice sweater, so you put it on, and then you're in your cozy sweater. Look at you being cozy. Now, there is a picture in the future of you in your, that's a Polaroid for the young youngins who don't know what they are. You are in, a, you are in that picture in the future wearing that sweater. 
Now, looking at that you getting the picture taken of you in the sweater is actually making the sweater be drawn to you in the, your past. You receiving that sweater in your past is actually drawn to you from the future by having a picture taken of you in it. Uh, I don't know if that makes sense, but that's how um, I've been helping myself visualize some of this. So here's the thing for yourself. With the Antis sweater, I guess maybe it's an Antis sweater paradox. Um, now, does that mean uh, before you write anything down or have any pictures taken of yourself, you should maybe make sure you, you want that thing that you are going to be drawing to yourself from your past exist. So if you don't, let's say, like the color of this one, it's got the Charlie Brown thing. My aunt, she has better taste. She wouldn't get me a Charlie Brown sweater, probably. Maybe she'll see this and she will, just as a funny joke. But let's say if it's a sweater you don't like, by not getting the picture taken of it, uh, I, I, I wonder about how to manipulate some of this. And I think part of it is understanding it in this kind of tug of war state. Now, I was alluding to earlier, and in my previous lecture, I covered the epistles of time. Very briefly, for those who maybe uh, need a refresher, so your epistles are, uh, you have your Frora. These are all of uh, your time, space-time, uh, which uh, really isn't two separate things, but one thing that um, in the same way that a film is not that you watch, like you sit down and watch a movie, um, it's made up of individual frames, but those individual frames are pictures. And so to either say this is space or this is time is just to look at the pictures and not look at the actual film. Um, anyways, so uh, Flora, and that's your solid um, solidified past. Uh, uh, and then you've got your Ega, which is your liquid. Then you have, I'm going to actually take off this hoodie because it is too hot. Uh, there we go. You have your Ega, it's future. That's your, um, that's your future. That's the uh, liquid. And that's the present. So this is past. This is present. Uh, then you have your future. And future, I define, would be un, un, um, a collapsed wave function. Uh, and the fields are not also aligned. So well, that is called vetter. Uh, is Venice my uh, uh, comrades? <laughs> and then, um, then you have your um, uh, pure energy, the pluva, which is your initial outpouring of of energy, uh, and that is plasma. And so. Um, that is the um, uh, you, you have your 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 past your present. Um, this is where you're living in probably. And I, I talked about before. I was unsure. Um, I do maybe think there might be um, some possibilities of uh, that. There might be um, more possibility of. of free will within this than maybe previously thought of, um, but maybe not as much as we would like, since we're still stuck on a um, deterministic mud ball heading towards a uh, iron Armageddon. Anyways, uh, and so what, what you have to understand is um, you have in the core, like I was talking on the previous slide, you have a white bowl. The white bowl is exerting its 
monopoly of creation. So everything's going out in. And as this is very hard to illustrate in uh, 2D planes, if I ever get a VR headset and the paintbrush, I could draw it a lot better, but just bear with me. So you have your initial outpouring. And then what you're having is as it builds up in density or as black holes are generated, they, the all singularities are connecting into the middle. And now, as I discussed in the previous lecture, when you have any type of matter and you condense it to a singularity, it, uh, well, I mean, look what happens when you take uh, uh, 23 uh, kilograms of uh, plutonium and uh, smash it together, um, uh, condense it into a higher density, and it causes instantaneous and constant uh, reaction. And that is generating, but it's also generating as it is being consumed. And so again, this is, uh, I'll talk about later in the lecture, that the kind of the end of paradox, that there isn't a beginning or an end, we're just looking at almost like a water system. And to, to understand time um, flowing almost as water. So the black holes are just whirlpools and you have this giant sphere and there's all these whirlpools heading down to a central point and between the whirlpools it is being generated outwards. So imagine that like a slice of the pie and there's also a white bowl here and it's generating, but then there's a, a black hole there and a white bowl here. There's a little white bowl, there's a black hole. And you just go all around and you can imagine it expanding in all directions and layering upon it itself um, and collapsing and uh, all the different um, uh, expressions of it. So understanding maybe a white bowl's um, emission is almost like a water spout. It's going to come up and then it's going to come down. You have your black holes. Those are kind of like our whirlpools. That's a white ball. And um, the past is kind of our big frozen core. So almost like you have the past and as it is generated, it creates this massive, massive um, uh, weight inside. And when it gets too massive, it collapses. And that's where your cracks appear and the whirlpools open to the singularity. And so that's your past. So the floral glacier would be, imagine all the past iterations of Earth over a year. That would kind of be like a glacier of our, our chronosphere, that it's, it's moving in this spiral, pulled forward in time by the magnetic fields and gravity, and also uh, pushed forward um, by the uh, wave of uh, shockwave from that um, that initial water spout or emission, a pluval water spout emission. I, I some of the language. I mean, I'm trying to use analogy because I really want it to make sense. But uh, you know, it's it's hard. First off, I'm trying to draw what's in my head, and um, it's uh, uh, anyways. You get it. Then, of course, you have fog, which would be our vetter. And so that would be the very, very thin veil all around the surface of this between the uh, black, black holes and the water spouts. And we are floating in our little ship. That is you or me. Hello. Uh, or... <laughs> Hey, <laughs> any uh, any proto-Semitic fans in the house? <laughs> Never mind. I'm hilarious with the studio audience. Anyways, uh, so that's the cyclic chronosphere. Uh, so essentially, what you have to look at, instead of there being this big bang and what have you, you're looking at a constantly cycling flow of water that 
is heated, is frozen, is refrozen, recycled, and respat out, recombined down to uh, nothing, and then into everything, and then back again. Um, and so that's the, the cyclic uh, chronosphere. Now, uh, I can already hear some of you crying in the comments, hey, wait, that contradicts blah, blah, blah. But I mean, in this, um, a lot of it actually buttresses on other parts of our pyramid. Um, and I'll remind people of where we're at on understanding our uh, pyramid, or I guess it's an octahedron. Um, but um, anywho, uh, next slide. Now, I'd like to just recite a little poem. Row, row, row your boat gently down the stream. Merrily, 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 life is but a dream. <laughs> now, imagine if you were, you're in a little boat, or since I am in Canada, unfortunately, um, uh, imagine that I'm in a canoe, and I am rowing said canoe through this stormy sea that I described on the um, previous slide. And now, as we are rowing, there is different types of aga that we are going to row through. Now, as, as I was describing before, aga is that thin liquid layer of malleable um, uh, uh, space time. Below us, you have your frozen glacier, the frora, which has been seen and it is no longer being interacted with. You have your aga, and that's where our little man in a boat is um, rowing. And now that is being seen and interacted with, and therefore um, it's in a liquid state. And then you have vetter, which is the fog, and that is uncollapsed wave function that's unperceived um, as of yet. And so it's it's kind of the fog that uh, the fog of war. If anybody's ever played. Um, Oh, let's see, uh, the, the, I think the, the Dune game was the first one with the Fog of War, maybe. It was in Warcraft, I remember that for sure. But imagine it is, you don't know what's actually behind there till you are going to perceive it. Um, you know, the, uh, uh, so, yeah. Now, as we're, now we're going to go look at Aga specifically. So we've got our, our a little guy, he's rowing his canoe. Now, for the times that are going well, you are wanting to look for what's called laminar flow. Now that is very calm, it's very stable. It's going to be uh, in one direction um, and it's also gonna be quite calm. It's not going to be, um, there's not gonna be any, any of the uh, previous things I talked about with the water spouts or what have you. It's just gonna be calm flowing, flowing um, aga. And now you can almost imagine this as like, Imagine you've got a big piece of pie, and pie day is coming up, so I hope people remember to celebrate it. May Even if it's a pizza pie, oh, hey oh, waka waka waka, here all night, folks. Tip your waitress, it's a pepperoni pizza, and that's the Parmesan crust, and the ooey gooey cheese inside, because I love Papa John's. Oh, man, I want to get some Papa John's. Anywho, um, so you've got your laminar flow. Now, laminar flow would almost be the top, the crust. You're, you're flowing here. Then when it starts to turn, you're going to have uh, turbulent flow right there, turbulent flow right there, and then laminar flow when you're upon one of the edges of our isosceles triangle here. But it's going to be more of a... Like you have to understand it's so hard to illustrate this in 2D planes when it's not. And now the um, the whirlpool, so to speak, now that would be your little black hole, your singularity, it's going to the center. You've got, as that would be your turbulent because everything in terms of the flow is going to start getting curved and loopy and, um, you know, the uh, that's no good for anybody. Um, fun fact, if you want to have fun with your signature, 
uh, you just go whoop de loop de loop de loop de loop and then when you sign the next time you just loop de loop and you just never actually finish your signature that's kind of what turbulent flow in a spiral would kind of be laminar flow you know you you have your beginning your starts and stops um, but turbulent flow is going to be chaotic maybe it's only one loop maybe it's infinite loops who knows we don't know um, uh, and you probably won't be around long enough to figure out which one you're in. Uh, so anyways, with laminar flow, as the you have your emission, your water spout here, that's creating all this, this um, emission of, of egg. Uh, well, it wouldn't be, it'd be pluva coming out, and then it's, as it's perceived, it's freezing into flora and flora and flora and on and on, and then right on that surface, we're in the egg again, right? And now the aga is on top of all this frozen. It's constantly expanding too. And so as it expands and expands, it's constantly adding new layers, just like a, a constantly refreshing water uh, a spout. But it's also being consumed. And so whether it stays in balance or if it starts, like we talk about, the um, they're saying it's uh, the amount of uh, dark matter is accelerating. Of course, uh, dark matter under this theory is actually just flora. Um, it's it's matter um, in the uh, in our past that's um, also exerting gravity upon us, as well as there's our our iron magnetism in the future that exists unperceived, but it's just because you can't perceive it doesn't mean it's not affecting you. Um, so there's that. Um, yeah, so laminar flow. Uh, so with Ega, you want to when you're trying to build temporal bridges and retrieve chiral relics, you're looking for places with laminar flow. It is safe. Um, you you're going to typically have rules, um, and um, it's also going to be less likely um, to have uh, mind-breaking paradoxes. Um, that. Uh, destroy your mind uh, and for, for with turbulent flow it's the opposite so it's going to be very unsafe for a human but for things that exist in turbulent flow they would look at our world as a incredibly stifling dangerous and stale in the same way that sailors would have looked at the doldrums in the Sargasso Sea as being deadly they would look at us as you know, oh, how do they exist in that? It's, you know, they live on, on planets with molten uh, ice, you know, and they, they drink the stuff um, because the, uh, they're, they're in such a high energy state. And so turbulent flow, everything is going to be topsy-turvy, you know, cats and dogs uh, sharing the uh, same, same sleeping arrangements, um, thunder and snow, all that kind of stuff. Also, uh, there wouldn't be rules. It'd be more just uh, chaos uh, and turbulent flow. And so you, you're not really sure, you know, uh, this this might be flowing on the top and now suddenly, oh, you go down into an eddy and now suddenly you're back here and uh, you're, you're having, you know, uh, paradoxes abound. But of course, I'll get into paradoxes later. Um, and uh, a lot of those mind-breaking paradoxes, such as this, you know, even even me working on this, um, it creates the paradox of okay, so if I am proposing that, you know, the um, you know gravity is just magnetism from the future, and we start and in, in, and we're in fact in a turbulent flow of ega because of some of this then am I creating a paradox around myself right now? Which I would say, hey, to. Huh? No, still not going to get laughed. Jeez, tough crowd. Okay, um, so yeah, we, we've gone over the different parts of this. You have the water spout coming up here. Um, and then, of course, uh, the flora fills up. You have your ega, and if, all around it, outside of it, uh, you have your, your, your vetter as it is perceived, it, it solidifies, condenses, so to speak, uh, into ega, which is then you, you are existing inside that. 
uh, yeah. Now, as all I've been talking uh, a few times now about is the paradoxes and the problems presented by this, um, uh, some of these theories. So one of them is, you know, you have um, there's a few ways to deal with it. It's one hand washes the other is the first one. You know, because Charlie Charlie says that, right? Charlie Charlie says one hand washes the other. And so you have to try to do the best for your future self to just finish the paradox. That's the thing. People are always like, oh, how do you break it? You don't. You're not. It's not about breaking the paradox. It's that you have to do these things. Break. Uh, there's no break. Instead, you make it. And um, perhaps that's where maybe I'm saying that if you, even if you are aware that you're in the middle of a time paradox, I guess it's up to you whether you continue to make it or break it. Um, but the forces around you might make it impossible for you to actually break the paradox. Um, so at the end of the day, it's just looking out for numero uno, making one hand wash the other. So your future self, who gets the picture taken with that sweater for the auntie's sweater, making sure that they're maybe, um, I don't know, buying you a lottery ticket. <laughs> I still buy mine, haven't won. So I don't know if that's a good thing or a bad thing. Anywho, um, the next piece is, you know, the, the I, I was mentioning it in the last slide, you know, myself and doing this, am I making myself into this bootstrapper? Hey, No, no, okay, it's still not funny. I'm gonna keep doing it till somebody starts laughing. Anywho, um, so you have your, your bootstrapper here and they're in this paradox. Now, uh, they recognize that by proposing the theory, they will create a paradox where they are, their life is controlled constantly so that they will make the theory. And so in this case, what should a person like myself Let's say I'm using myself as an example. If I'm a bootstrapper in this case, uh, what should a person do? Well, obviously, I've chosen to finish the paradox, and I, I hope if anybody else is uh, uh, interested in this, maybe they think about uh, maybe doing me a solid and um, hitting that like button, or buying a book um, of mine, uh, so that uh, I can maybe uh, not have to. Uh, go to work tomorrow. <laughs> Anywho, uh, jokes aside, so you have your bootstrapper, they, they make the paradox, uh, and the thing is everything in their life has been set up to make them make the paradox. And then it comes down to the question is, should you, as the bootstrapper, make the paradox? Should you complete it? Uh, sorry, I had to sneeze there, but what I'm essentially saying is uh, I'm not sure if um, it does really matter if you do it this time around or if you do it the next time around or if you never do it and just eventually, you know, I, I don't know about the multiverse too um, with this actually because um, since it's always being consumed, this, this chronosphere is kind of always being consumed and... Um, uh, torn apart by these forces that um, I wonder if it's maybe the same universes where there's life and planets is the same as maybe um, uh, perfect numbers, right? So we we, we have um, 51 known perfect numbers. We've got, I think, six and uh, what was it? Is it 20, 24, 28? I don't remember. 28, I think. Uh, and then, you know, 400 and uh, like 86 or something. I don't remember. Uh, I don't have my note on that in front of me. Anyways, uh, so you have only, but you only have between uh, one and the like 100 and whatever, 
I don't remember, I saw it, it was obscenely high to the power of 50 or some 500 or whatever. Um, we've searched all these numbers and we've only found 51. And now, I mean, the universe is considerably bigger than that, of course, but uh, I think at the end of the day, it's not that it's not, you know, they're not out there. It's that unfortunately the, the amount of searching through uh, the bowls of oatmeal, so to speak, would make anybody looking for life probably get quite uh, discouraged after a while. Um, especially since we're all going to be, uh, if we're perceiving ourselves from that time dimension to, uh, to anybody looking at us, we're going to lean into the Geiges theories here. Anybody perceiving a human being is going to see these, these very strange plants, this slime mold that seems to connect and divide and, you know, it, it just kind of grows and bulges out and then it lays over and then it disperses into a bunch of little uh, smaller bugs and bees that all fly out of it and those things get reconsumed. It's kind of this auto-cannibalizing system. But in the same way, it actually is reflecting the whole. In the same way that chronosphere is constantly consuming itself and re Newing itself, so is this us, this giant crawling chaos. Um, so yeah, that's um. Anyways, um, I don't know what you think about if you were a bootstrapper, would you have came out and put out this theory, knowing that it might actually create a paradox? I don't know. I don't know. I, eh, I don't know, because I'm just perceiving it. I don't know. Anyways, finally is perception and uh, projection. So we, we look at the system, and this is where my problem with the whole Big Bang thing comes out. Um, so you have the Big Bang. And it's all so interesting, you know. We, we are applying our, we're projecting an ego defense that the universe is the same as us. Uh, which, I mean, we are in some ways, I think. But we're not, perhaps, in the ways that we want to think. You know, the universe doesn't have a beginning and an end, and neither do we. You're a uh, observer inside of a body, watching things through this meat lattice that has been grown and raised and brought through this this mud and dust, pushed and pulled on by all these forces and fields, and you are able to perceive and make and stabilize the surrounding. Um, uh, ega so that it's habitable uh, for yourself and who knows maybe other things perhaps and this is um, I'll go into it in, in later Geige's uh, lecture but um, perhaps humanity is actually in the same way imagine a peace lily I like peace lilies anybody who knows me knows I have a great love of peace lilies they're my favorite flower um, and so now the peace lily, this hermaphroditic plant that, you know, for us, me, looking at the peace lily, it's just there. But for what's actually is, you know, each one is an iteration of the last one. And it's always growing and splitting. And any alien looking down at us is doing that. But now why do I have a peace lily? Well, because according to NASA, uh, they are the best, one of the best flowers for cleaning the air. And so that's why I actually got into raising peace lilies. And now I wonder, are us, is our relationship with the universe around us maybe in a similar fashion? We're a, uh, we are a wave function collapsing peace lily that another species is perhaps exploiting. Um, so um, that's fun. Um, and look for that in a upcoming book I'm working on, actually. So I, I think I've mentioned this before, but basically... Most of my fiction is a way for me to explore uh, my theories of physics in the same way that, uh, you know, old J.R.R. Tolkien was exploring his uh, languages in uh, Middle Earth. Um, so, yeah, anywho, uh, buy my books. All right. And now for my favorite part of the uh, lecture and the one that I'm sure some of my viewers have been most interested in is military applications. The first one I would like to talk about is the tachyon weir. 
Now, what you need to understand about constructing a tachyon weir is that uh, it... All right, thank you everybody for reaching the end of the lecture. I'm sorry, I kind of got off on a rant on that previous slide, but here we are at the end. So thank you everybody for sticking around. Now, um, what, what we're looking at here is a lot of the theories, uh, I, I, as I mentioned earlier, people are looking at going, what is what does that mean? What is going on here? And as I've, as I've discussed before, that all these theories, you have to look at them as kind of like these, uh, the faces of an octahedral. Sorry, it is a very poorly drawn, oh goodness. Sorry, it's, uh, um, it's difficult to capture. Uh, so you have this octahedron and um, you have these different faces of it. And now, as I mentioned on this one, you know, I was like, oh, this part leans into the guy gaze. And so um, that's our, that unknown unknown. And then of course, you know, we have our uh, Yontian, which is your known known, you have a mythomite, which is your um, uh, known unknown. And then your, um, of course, you have a Tonian, which is your unknown known. And then on the bottom half, now this is, uh, I've talked about it before, the, you have your dimensional equator um, and you have your, your theories on the bottom side, right? So there's the sig signari, signotic. You have your uh, Sargon. And then you've got your um, uh, as uh, oh, come on. As, as tar as, uh, my pen is not as tar exagatal. And then finally, um, you've got your Cubotic. Now, uh, all of these theories are actually buttressing on to each other, and so none of them are meant to stand on their own, and they don't actually, uh, you, you can't perceive them fully from any one spot, and so our spot in time, I believe, um, we can see some of Yuvatan, some of Mythamite, a lot of Yontian, uh, especially with chiral relics. I think that one's a really important part of understanding um, the buttressing and how it all fits together. Um, and uh, chiral relics is, is going to be an important part of the um, advanced uh, Yontian lecture. Uh, and so... Um, they're all fitting together, but at the same time, they're also contradictory. But the thing is, there is no contradictions in the same way that if you have a side of the hill that receives sun, and then you have another side of a hill that doesn't receive sun, is that dark side of the hill somehow an aberrant um, type of sunshine or, or hill? No, it's just it's out of the sun. And the next day, when the light's on it, it'll it'll be in the sun and it'll make sense when it's being viewed from that perspective. 